talking about weaning, which is liberation from the mechanical ventilator. Once we are sure that there is a reversal in the condition for which the patient was ventilated, we can consider to take the ventilator off. That is the first thing we need to do. And the two aspects of weaning are taking the respiratory support away and extubating the patient. Once we are sure that the patient can be extubated, only then it's worthwhile to do weaning. And for extubation, we need to be sure that the airway of the patient is protected, that they are fairly awake and alert. This is somehow difficult to achieve sometimes because these patients are on prolonged sedation and analgesia. The effects of these drugs may linger on. Sometimes it is difficult to take them out because they can become agitated restless, they may be delirious, in which case assessment may sometimes become very difficult of the sensorium, but this is something that we learn over time. And they should be stable hemodynamically, not on increasing inotrope support or on very minimal of them. And the cough reflex should be good. We just make a bedside assessment, ask them to cough vigorously. We can even quantitate this by putting a flow meter at the end of the ET tube, these are specially designed for this, and look at what is the cuff expiratory flow rate, and if they are able to generate flow rates of more than 60 liters per minute, we would consider this to be a good cuff reflex. Regarding the respiratory support, we need to do you know, minimal support, and what is that? An FIO2 of 40 to 50 percent, a peep of less than 5, respiratory rate of less than 30, tidal volume of more than 5 ml per kg body weight, we can look at the ratio between these two, the respiratory rate and the tidal volume, which is known as the rapid shallow breathing index. And we look for a number which is less than 105. It's just a number, but to give you a gist of it, if we have higher respiratory rate and lower tidal volumes, then the chances of success will be lower. The secretion should be manageable. We can also assess their muscle strength by the maximal inspiratory pressure that they can generate. How do we do that? We can put them on 0p, put an expiratory hold, ask the patient to take a deep breath and see how much drop in the pressure that can produce. This can be visible on the peep on the monitor. Or we can put them on pressure trigger, put it at the least sensitivity, which on most ventilators would be minus 20 centimeters and see if they can trigger a breath. If they are able to do so, at least that much of inspiratory pressure they are able to generate. This would be a fair reflection of the strength of the muscles which are commonly involved as neuromuscular weakness in critically ill patients. We also look at the heart. We know that mechanical ventilation is favorable to the left side of the heart. It improves contractility. It decreases the afterload. And when the ventilator is taken off, those with marginal hearts can decompensate. Look at heart rates which are less than 140, BP which is stable. And we can also look at the cuff leak, especially for patients who are at greater risk for post-extubation stridor. This is because the tube can cause irritation of the larynx, the trachea, can cause edema of the airways, and when we take them out, the airways may remain compromised. How do we do that? We just put off the cuff, Look at the leak on the ventilator. In absolute number, at least 110 ml of leak is what we expect. If it is less than that, then you can consider there to be wall edema of the airways. What are the options we have for weaning? Well, we can put them straight on spontaneous breathing or on low flow oxygen. Or we may consider high flow nasal oxygen therapy in which heated humidifier High flow oxygen is delivered through a slugney feeding nasal cannula which can generate modest amounts of PEEP, maybe at around 4 cm, provide a good FiO2 and this may be useful in certain hypoxemic patients. Or we can consider non-invasive ventilation. Although it is also a form of in 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 ventilation, it is still considered a part of weaning. These patients may have a little higher requirement also of the respiratory support but we know we can supplement it by NIV. The only thing you need to be sure of that they are able to protect their airways and they are able to handle their secretions. Once we have identified 
the patient, these criteria. Next, we need to look at the strategies we have in place of how to start the weaning. Now let us look at what are the weaning strategies. They are basically dependent on gradually decreasing the respiratory support. You can do it whichever way. If the patient is on a support mode, gradually decrease the pressures. If they are on intermittent mandatory ventilation, decrease the mandatory breaths. You can try an ASV, adaptive servo ventilation. But basically there is no chosen mode. It's an idea that we gradually withdraw ask the patient to make greater efforts, take bigger breaths and then see how they handle them. So mode may not be important, the idea is. We can put them straight away on spontaneous breathing but with an ET tube which is fairly long, has a narrow diameter, there could be a lot of resistance to the work of breathing which may actually make the weaning a failure. What do we do then? We can put them on a minimal support, which is around 5 to 8 centimeters of water. Continue to give it to them when they are on ET tube. This may not be necessary if they are on a tracheostomy tube. And see how they fare with it. We can also try automatic tube compensation. So some ventilators can calculate the resistance which these airways produce, compensate it, so that that much amount of support is given to the patient with every breath. What should be the duration? Generally, we give it for 30 to 120 minutes and see how the patients fare. If they do well, we say it is successful. Weaning attempts may be, have to be multiple. It may run over days also. But the idea is to see that they do not get compromised too much during this trial of withdrawal of support. So keep a keen eye. Observe. Major things, the heart rate, the respiratory rate, the saturation, you can do the ABGs to look at the carbon dioxide levels and the senses. Because hypoxia and CO2 retention both may cause worsening in senses, this may also compromise the airway. Keep assessing for the airways regularly. They need to be protected all the time. Work of breathing. We can look at the signs of respiratory distress like indrawing of the chest muscles, Paradoxical movement of the abdomen, use of accessory muscles, nasal flaring, rising respiratory rates or maybe shallow breathing at times. Then we know the patients are not tolerating the withdrawal of support. Cardiac compromise should also be looked into because positive pressure is, as we said, is helpful to the left ventricle. Sometimes withdrawal of that support, that PEEP, may actually decompensate the heart. So look at blood pressures and heart rates, look at the cardiac condition, make sure the volume status is adequate, not too much so that they can go into pulmonary edema and see that the failure to weaning is not due to cardiac causes. What would be defined failure of weaning as? Well, the reintubation in 48 hours. This is also a statistical tool which is used. We should not fear this. 5% to 10% reintubation rates are okay, acceptable maybe. That depends on what kind of unit one runs. But if we fear reintubation, maybe we prolong the intubation for too long, which can cause greater length of stay and complications related to mechanical ventilation. Well, on the other side, if we withdraw them early, then it can cause compromise and may worsen the morbidity and mortality. So the timing of weaning, the way we do it should be well timed. We should also make sure that the patients do not decompensate during this period of time. And the best is to have a mix of clinical judgment and some hard numbers that we discussed and to learn from our own experiences.